All right, guys. Thank you so much, Jack, for that introduction. I really appreciate you guys having me out here tonight. Um, so, yeah, like Jack said, uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about controlled environmental agriculture, which is uh, a big growing industry in the U.S. right now. Uh, so to define that a little bit better, um, a CEA, uh, as we call it, is uh, essentially a method of indoor plant cultivation uh, in order to uh, produce food crops, right? So uh, you use varying levels of low or high tech technology to optimize growing conditions for plant production and distribution, right? So uh, this could be extremely low tech, like just a, you know, a basic structure. This could be lots of sensors and lights and high cost uh, sort of production method. So uh, the reason that it's growing in popularity in the US is just because of the general structure of food production here. So in the Midwest, right where we are, we grow lots of corn, lots of soybeans. So a lot of these cereal crops, like wheat, barley, um, are all from this area, and uh, it's because this is the ideal condition for them to grow, right? Um, out west, you have some like fruit production, vegetable production, leafy greens. In the south, you have things like watermelon, other fruits, citrus in Florida, right? So this is uh, just different centers of production for different types of plants based on the types of environments that they grow best in. Um, but the real center for agriculture in the U.S., as far as like the leafy greens and the fruits that we know and love, is California, right? So most of the production that we are familiar with is actually grown out there. And uh, besides just California, a lot of uh, our fresh produce comes from uh, Mexico. So we import a lot of fruits and vegetables from Mexico. We export a lot of cereal crops that they can't really grow there. Uh, and then we also import and export from Canada, who doesn't have a California or a Mexico center of agricultural production. So we trade a lot with them to try and get them the stuff that they want, right? So where does this food actually go? And how much of it is being locally consumed? So Midwest up here, right? This graph is a little bit misleading. It's talking about the amount of calories that we consume. And in the Midwest, and in the United States in general, we consume a lot of cereal crops, a lot of corn, a lot of soy, a lot of things like that. And so um, this graph is a little bit misleading because obviously this is very highly local because we're growing a lot of uh, these types of cereal crops here. But when we look at big urban centers out in California, up in New York City, Boston, um, a lot of their produce isn't able to be grown there or it has to be transported long distances to get there uh, to just meet the demand and the requirement for a lot of people. Uh, and so we have you know, zero to 20% local production in these big areas. So that brings us to how we transport food and how that plays into this entire system. So if we're thinking about lettuce, leafy greens, average shelf life is around 10 to 21 days right, from the time of harvest. Um, transportation itself, via trucks or whatever other method, takes like three to five days. So up to half of your agricultural um, uh, produce is actually already at like half of its shelf life by the time it gets to you, by the time it gets to the, the grocery store even. So I'm sure we've all bought heads of lettuce and they, within two days, you're throwing it out, you're going back to the store, you're just, oh, screw it, I'm not gonna eat vegetables this week, it's fine, I'll get them next week, you know? So it's, it's a big problem because uh, during the transportation process, the uh, nutritional quality of the plants actually declines significantly because they start decomposing slightly, they're not in the soil anymore, they're not happy, so uh, a lot of those compounds and vitamins and minerals that we want to get from these vegetables breaks down, so we have to buy and eat more of them to maintain the same nutritional content as if we were uh, eating them fresh, right? So Ohio specifically, we import a lot of our fresh produce from the West Coast, from Mexico, so we're peeling off stickers that say somewhere in Mexico something in Spanish that you, know, you never pay attention to, but uh, really what that's signifying is that the average piece of produce in this country is traveling 1,500 miles or more, right, to get to your plate. Uh, and if we look at where Columbus is, this is a 1,500-mile radius circle, right, from the center of Columbus. 
Uh, and we're not even touching California, and we're not even touching most of the agricultural production in Mexico. So we're really talking about like more like 2,000 miles of travel to get a lot of this produce to us, right? So that's where CEA is coming in and trying to change the industry a little bit, right? So by creating this sort of artificial environment or modified environment, you can localize your agricultural production to uh, very specific regions. You can produce fresh, high quality food, reduce transportation and the nutritional loss and the cost of that sort of industry, and then also supply jobs locally to people uh, in this kind of cooler, high tech sort of environment that people think is really interesting. Um, one of the major drawbacks, obviously, to this sort of production system is its cost. So there's a huge capital cost to building a greenhouse and maintaining and establishing that sort of environment. Um, and then, in like somewhere in Ohio, we have to supplement with grow lights because most of the year we're not getting enough light to grow these plants. So high electricity costs come in. Uh, that adds to your capital cost to buy all these lights. Uh, and then maintenance of all of this sort of uh, technology uh, comes at a premium as well. So you run into some significant problems, but CEA has a lot of benefits that are pretty interesting, like the fact that we can produce plants year-round in somewhere like Ohio, where normally four months or five months of the year you can't grow anything. So this is a really, really low-tech, uh, it's called a hoop house, right? So it's basically a wireframe structure with some really simple, uh, like covering of plastic, right? And it transmits a little bit of light, but in somewhere like Ohio, that can extend your growing season by, main, by insulating these plants a little bit. Uh, so at the beginning of, the, of your season, you can add two weeks of growing time. At the end of your season, you can add two weeks of growing time. So an extra month of food production where normally you wouldn't have it is actually a pretty big benefit to, to farmers, um, especially in somewhere like Ohio, right? Um, this is a higher tech greenhouse, right? So this is a traditional like glass greenhouse. It's huge. Uh, you can grow plants year round, um, produce fresh local produce all the time. Um, it's even in the winter where it might be costly, but you're still producing something locally. And uh, you know, as far as like leafy greens, the amount of production in the winter time declines significantly anyway. So the quality of produce you get in the winter is usually a lot lower and uh, a lot more sparse and more expensive. So this way, you can increase your profit margins, you can increase the amount of local nutritious food available to people. So one of the other great things is because you're in an enclosed environment, you have more control over that environment, which means you can reduce a lot of different issues uh, as far as like insects and disease, right? So. You guys remember the uh, uh, E. coli outbreaks in romaine lettuce over the last few years? Well, CEA was able to skirt that entire epidemic, right? So they became the main supplier of romaine lettuce for short periods of time during these E. coli outbreaks because they didn't have this kind of issue where they had exposure to pathogens and uh, uh, other things that can make us sick. Um, plus, in the field, you have really high exposure to insects and things that can damage your crop, damage your fruit. Uh, reduce the quality of the products that you're, you're, uh, you're trying to sell. And so uh, you can reduce a lot of these issues by having a controlled environment where you can't have this spread of insects and disease. Um, and that ultimately leads to less chemical controls. So things like pesticides, herbicides, even weed control, spraying Roundup in your fields where it gets in, uh, absorbed into these plants. It, it's not as big of an issue because you almost need just like a bare minimum or not at all for some of these uh, chemical controls. So this is a really, really, really interesting thing. You can avoid a lot of this input, right? And it saves cost. And then the other thing with efficiency that's interesting is that you can obviously use more efficient energy systems, install solar panels, stuff like that. That's a big, uh, big interest lately. But um, you can also recirculate water and make this really efficient. So uh, this sort of filtration system will take the water that's been irrigated through the plants, and then it'll take it, recirculate it, filter it, send it right back, and then you can keep reusing the same water without wasting a lot, which is really important, obviously, for the future of the world. So uh, it's just an interesting system with benefits. 
And speaking of water use, uh, next year in 2020, the biggest vertical farm in the world is going to open in Dubai for a big conference. Uh, they'll be able to supply 72,000 heads of lettuce per month uh, using 99% less water than open field production currently can. All right, so this is like awesome, you know. Uh, the other side of this is that you can often set higher standards for taste and quality. So something like heirloom tomatoes, right? We all love heirloom tomatoes, but when you see them, they're expensive. When you buy them, sometimes they're not the best. It's very variable. So what we can do is with CEA production is because you're avoiding a lot of the abiotic stress, right? Weather changes, pesticides, chemical treatments, uh, insect pressure, disease, because we can avoid that with CEA, we can grow these high quality cultivars indoors without having to go through expensive and time consuming breeding processes to get them to the point where we can actually produce this kind of fruit uh, in high enough quality to sell where it's economically viable. Plus, you can achieve other specific targets. Um, so like this is, uh, this is Japanese honeydew. So in Japan, there are some greenhouses that uh, go with a highly specific route. So they trim off any and all fruit production from each plant, except for one fruit per plant. And what they do is, essentially, because there's only one fruit, uh, that all of that plant's energy, all of its production, all of its sugar that it's producing goes into just that one fruit. And because it's doing that, the fruit tastes phenomenally better. Just, it's, they're unreal. Uh, and because of that, they make their price points somewhere like 100 to $200 per fruit. Um, but they're just a delicacy. They're, it's almost like a status symbol in some ways. So this is just a really interesting application, and they do this with other things. So like you've seen the square watermelon in Japan. Those aren't edible. The square watermelons that you might have seen, just not edible at all, right? You put it on a shelf, and, you, and it's a status symbol for like several weeks until it decomposes, and you got to throw it away, right? It's, just, it's, it's not edible. So um, very interesting kind of qualities. All right, so there's been a lot of growing interest, and a lot of businesses have started to show more interest in CEA in the US. So like Wendy's, we're all familiar with the fast food chain, right? Um, in 2018, they switched to only greenhouse grown tomatoes in the US and Canada. So that, that's, they don't grow, they don't purchase any open field production anymore. Uh, and they cited things like uh, predictability and quality uh, as some of the major drivers for them making this change. They weren't achieving the type of consistency that they wanted with open field production. So they switched solely to greenhouses and also, just the reduction of chemical pesticides as a uh, trying to be a more health conscious sort of company, they uh, decided that this would maybe be the best option for them, right? And it's worked out so far for over a year. Um, another thing with CEA, right? We were talking, bring it back to these urban centers. Um, it's really hard to ship in produce, right? And then when they do ship in produce, often it's not very successful. So. Uh, in NYC, 20 plus percent of all produce is wasted, thrown away. In the U.S. in general, 165 billion dollars or 160 billion pounds of food is thrown away, right, to landfills every year. Uh, and most people throw away 40 percent of their groceries that they purchase, right? So some of the solutions for this to avoid the, the loss and the nutritional decline of, of uh, produce uh, during transportation is to bring the produce production to these major centers, right? So use CEA, essentially. So places like Gotham Greens, right? This is a big greenhouse on top of an already existing warehouse. Uh, and um, Aero Farms, which is a vertical farm, and both of these exist just outside of New York City in Newark, New Jersey, right? And um, they've been so successful and so uh, profitable in that region that they've actually expanded to Chicago, Boston, uh, Providence, Rhode Island, to uh, uh, Baltimore. I mean, just uh, it's, it's taken off as, as a big trend in that area, and it's supplying lots of local produce um, to those people, which is, which is a really fantastic thing uh, to start bringing that agriculture back to these major population centers. Another thing CEA offers is that you can, because we can control the environment so specifically, we can employ them in extreme environments. So these are a couple 
lower tech greenhouses employed in Alaska, right? And the average price of tomatoes in Alaska is $3.50 per pound, right? That's the average yearly price, right? So in the winter, it's even higher. Uh, and what happens is beca because of this uh, issue, and there's such a big land uh, you know, gap to travel, uh, they actually fly in most of their produce, and it takes usually like 10 to 14 days to get produce to them instead of three to five. Uh, so a lot of these places, especially these, um, there's a lot of native colonies and uh, other people that have, have partnered with uh, companies to start building greenhouses and supply their produce locally instead of shipping it in. And in Ohio, tomatoes on average are about $2 a pound. So this is a good way to kind of take back the agriculture in, the, in those environments, right? Another problem is that when you ship these long distances, obviously nutrients decline. And so less than 50% of people get the recommended intake of vitamins A, C, uh, D, folate, fiber. So like vitamins and minerals greatly reduced in these regions. It's really hard to maintain the proper amounts needed. So there's a lot of issues there. Um, so this is one way to kind of combat that. Um, take a look at somewhere where CEA has been really successful. Uh, up in the Netherlands, Denmark, Holland, um, they've employed these, these greenhouse systems uh, in a highly local way, right? So they integrated them into city planning. So you have someone's residential house right next to somebody's industrial greenhouse that's huge, okay? And um, most of the produce that's eaten in those countries is actually grown indoors locally. So they don't have the same kind of California, Mexico uh, benefit that we have. And so they have to produce a lot of this produce on their own. And this is one of the best solutions in a place where it's a little bit more difficult to grow crops year round, right? Uh, Canada has taken over a similar trend, right, to kind of break off of that reliance on the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, a lot of their greenhouses uh, have been built there over the last 40 years. Um, so this is uh, from Ace Lufa, right? So this is uh, Lufa Farms in Montreal, Canada. And um, this facility is a rooftop facility, and I kind of cut it off, but this place is actually massive. Uh, and this entire facility runs entirely off rainwater. So there's absolutely no connection to any of the city plumbing. They run exclusively off of rainwater collected, and that's it, right? So they have circulation systems to, to, to manage that, right? And they grow things like herbs, uh, spring onions, and uh, I got to visit there back in February, so, um, you know, in case you want to see a fun picture of me with a Snapchat filter, right? Um, the future of CEA, obviously, it's, it's growing, right? So 50% um, of domestic tomatoes are now produced indoors, right? Which has really only been over the last like 25 years. So this is like a huge, huge, huge industry that's starting to develop. Um, in 2016, it was worth about $14 billion. It's definitely grown since then. Um, and the US has about 2,221 acres, right? Um, according to the latest estimates. but Places like the Netherlands has like 28,000, right? Spain has 173,000, and China takes the cake with 203,000 acres of indoor production, right? So this could very much be a way to enhance and supplement our current agricultural industry in the future, uh, and following kind of the same guidelines as a lot of these countries have, right? So they've essentially implemented it in such an effective way that it's a very valuable resource now. Now, other benefits to CEA, right? You can relegate a lot of this to agriculture, but some of it is not really agriculturally based as well. So cannabis has been a huge player in the uh, CEA market over the last few years, especially in Canada, now that's federally legal. And then there's a lot of interest in the US as well. So uh, you know, when you can highly control a growing environment, you can actually um, maintain a high crop quality, you can reduce all chemical use, right, to the bare minimum, and make it uh, the safest, most profitable product that you can make. So somewhere like this, this grow room is probably worth about uh, like a quarter of a million dollars in products right here, when this place probably produced that in about 12 to 14 weeks, you know? So 14 weeks, quarter of a million dollars, that's a pretty ridiculous thing. So. Um, Besides just you know, food and weed, right? Uh, there's a lot of interest in CEA for something like space, right? So this is a 
Um, <laughs> this is a growing unit that's gonna, that is in development at Kennedy NASA Space Center in Florida. And this uh, is a series of vegetable crops, right, and other uh, sort of leafy greens that uh, is being tested and developed to be attached as a compartment on the ISS in the next decade, right? So you can use it for water filtration, you can use it for oxygen replenishment, um, you can use it for uh, decomposition of certain things, and then also to produce food for these explorers, right? And beyond just the ISS, there's obviously interest, we've all seen the Martian, I'm sure, but there's obviously interest in using this on Mars over the next couple decades, or whenever we get there, uh, to establish sort of an agricultural setting. Uh, otherwise, we're not gonna be able to stay there very long. Um, now, if we talk about, just to wrap up here, um, thought I'd bring it back to like our local production, Ohio specifically. Um, there's a lot of CEA in Ohio, surprisingly. So this is Nature Fresh. This is in Delta, Ohio. This is a tomato vining, tomato crop greenhouse. Um, and they grow tomatoes year round, right? Uh, this is Davidson Family Growers. This, is, this picture was taken in February, right? Um, it's not super bright in there, but this is an environment where there's, they're growing about like 6,000 heads of lettuce um, and distributing it locally. So it's very integrated into this community in a small rural uh, area, and they're actually most of their sales go to the University of Dayton as part of their uh, um, uh, their lunch, whatever you know, what I'm talking about like their food programs uh, to uh, that, are, that are based in a lot of the dorms. Um, Buckeye Fresh in, in Medina, Ohio, up north, is servicing a lot of the Cleveland area with a vertical farming system, and then. Uh, Vigio Gardens uh, is a special place for me in Akron. This is where I got my start in agriculture. Had not considered anything remotely agricultural. Some friends of mine started this business. I helped build a lot of these racks, grew lettuce, basil, and microgreens, and so this is where I got my start in horticulture, period. Right? And this is what developed my interest in, in CEA in the first place. So uh, that's really cool. And then my, my favorite place in Ohio right now is uh, Old Souls Farm in St. Paris. This is also taken in February. But if you can see, there's like six different varieties of lettuce. There's basil back here. There's all kinds of other spinach uh, in the back and on the other side. Uh, and so this place grows uh, like a lot of produce, right? And they distribute a lot of it locally. And so this is stuff that you can actually buy uh, in stores now. So I think it's really interesting. But um, there we go. So, uh, shameless plug. This is this is my research greenhouse with my watermelon. But um, uh, I hope that that was at least interesting or enlightening. So, thank you guys a lot for your attention, and and, and please hit me with any questions. Yeah.